In this Q&A video, we're going to answer the question, how do I select the correct containment materials for my electrical installation? Just before we explain the answer to this question, please be aware that this video is one of a series that we've made on the subject of containment in association with Marshall Tuflex. They can be viewed individually, or you can click the link in the description below to view them as part of a free online training package to help you with your CPD and receive a certificate to prove you've completed the course. Containment is the backbone of an electrical installation, carrying your conductors to where they need to be and keeping them safe from harm. But it can only do that if it's capable of withstanding the environment that it's installed into. Part 5 of BS7671 covers the selection and erection of equipment. Chapter 52 refers to wiring systems in particular, and in Regulation Group 522 we find the heading Selection and Erection of Wiring Systems in Relation to External Influences. This group of regulations is broken down into a number of areas covering different things that can negatively affect wiring systems once they're installed. We're not going to cover every single one of them in this video, but just to take a sampling here, we've got things like ambient temperature, presence of water or high humidity, presence of corrosive or polluting substances, solar radiation and ultraviolet radiation, and so on. You'll notice that next to almost every one of these, there's a two-letter code, AA, AB, AD, and so on. These refer to different environmental factors that we need to consider when selecting the correct equipment for our installations. Appendix 5 of the regs explains how these codes work. The first letter gives you the general category of external influence. The second letter identifies the nature of the external influence. And then once you get past generalities and into specifics, there'll also be a number that relates to the class within the external influence. There's a list in Appendix 5 that shows all the different influences. So to take an example, looking at AA4, you can see it means the electrical installation is likely to experience temperatures between minus 5 degrees C and 40 degrees C, and so should be made of materials that can function under those circumstances. So you may come across regulations that state the installation needs to be able to operate under conditions of one of these codes. You can turn to this appendix for what that means, and then over the next few pages there's information on the characteristics required for selecting and erecting the correct equipment, and references to other standards that apply as well. Now, we're particularly interested in containment in this video, so we're going to think about situations where external influences might have a negative impact on trunking, tray, and the like. When it comes to containment, you've got a choice between two broad types of material, one being a plastic of some kind, and the other a type of metal. Common plastics used include PVCU, which stands for polyvinyl chloride. The U just means unplasticized, which basically means it hasn't been treated with a certain agent during processing, which leaves the plastic stronger and non-flexible, which is what you want in a piece of trunking. There's also polycarbonate, which is the same material used in bulletproof glass. Could be an interesting test for Marshall Tuflex's products there. ABS, which in this context is nothing to do with the brakes on your car, but rather stands for acrylonitrile butadiene styrene. And finally, a specialised material called GRP, or glass reinforced polyester. The range of metals used for containment include steel, which is far and away the most common metal used for containment, and one that Marshall Tuflex has now thrown itself into offering alongside their plastic containment. Less common, but still an option for containment in certain circumstances, is aluminium. Lightweight, corrosion resistant, and tough. It's a bit more pricey than steel, and so is usually restricted to specialist applications like bench or dado trunking. So what type of containment should you be using in different environments? Well, there's a few factors to consider. One of the main ones is the risk of impact. Regulation 522.6.1 states that wiring systems shall be selected and erected so as to minimise the damage arising from mechanical stress, e.g. by impact, abrasion, penetration, tension or compression during installation, use or maintenance. Commenting on this regulation, Guidance Note 1, Selection and Erection, explains that any part of the fixed installation that may be exposed to mechanical damage must be able to survive it. How can this be achieved? Regulation 522.6.2 explains for areas of particular risk. In a fixed installation where impacts of medium severity, AG2, or high severity, AG3, can occur, protection shall be afforded by 1. The mechanical characteristics of the wiring system, so considering the materials that the containment is made of, or 2. The location selected, in other words, placing the containment somewhere it's not likely to get whacked, or 3. The provision of additional local or general protection against mechanical damage, for example, adding a sturdy steel barrier in front of the containment, or 4. Any combination of the above. 
Interestingly, it adds this point in a note. Examples are areas where the floor is likely to be penetrated and areas used by forklift trucks. So in a warehouse setting where forklifts are whizzing around, this would be classed as an area with an external influence designation of AG2 or AG3. In this instance and similar, those indents are all good options. But focusing on the first one there, it would make sense that if there is a risk of mechanical damage that can't be mitigated by the other means, that you would select steel containment to protect the conductors inside, as this will take the most physical abuse without failing completely. Marshall Tuflex have actually just recently launched a range of steel containment, including robust steel trunking, that would be a perfect option in this situation. One of the downsides to steel containment is that it is highly susceptible to corrosion from atmospheric moisture. For this reason, we find this direction in Guidance Note 1 under subheading 4.7, Presence of Corrosive or Polluting Substances AF. Bearing in mind that AF is an external influence code, it's not being used as it might be on social media comments. Anyway, it reads, In damp situations where metal cable sheaths and armour of cables, metal conduit and conduit fittings, metal ducting and trunking systems and associated metal fixings are liable to chemical or electrolytic attack by materials of a structure with which they may come into contact, it is necessary to take suitable precautions against corrosion, such as galvanising or plating. Although there are different finishes of steel conduit available, it's pretty rare for steel trunking and tray to be anything but galvanised nowadays. There are two widespread types of galvanising used in the manufacture of electrical containment. The first is electroplating, which applies a very thin, very even layer of zinc to the surface of the tray or trunking. This is the cheapest, most common type of containment protection and is great for general indoor use. If you're taking your containment outside, however, it will still corrode over time, and so the other type of protection performs better here, namely hot dip galvanised. This is where the piece of containment is placed into a bath of molten zinc, which then sets on the steel once it's been removed from the bath, giving a thicker coating and a higher level of protection. This type of finish is suitable for outdoor use as long as there isn't any exposure to chemical or marine elements. More on this in a moment. There's also two other terms you'll come across regularly when it comes to galvanising, which is pre-galvanised and post-galvanised. Pre-galvanising is where the sheet that will be formed into the containment gets treated with the zinc coating before it's then folded into its final shape and has all the holes and things like that punched into it. Post-galvanising happens the other way round. The material is folded, cut and punched into its final form and is then treated with some form of zinc protection. Interestingly, when something like cable tray is pre-galvanised, the cuts and holes made to turn it from flat sheet metal to the cable tray we all know and love don't receive a direct coating of the galvanising material. So will these unprotected edges start to rust away? Well, interestingly, the answer is no, or at least not immediately. The zinc in the coating protects the steel in two ways. The first is that it acts as a barrier, preventing oxygen in the atmosphere and water from corroding the steel. But the second is that it acts as a sacrificial layer. We're going to talk a little later in the video about the galvanic series and how it can harm our electrical installation. But in this situation, it actually helps it. Basically, where the bare steel and the zinc sit close to each other, if they come into contact with moisture, they create a galvanic couple, which is essentially how a cell or a battery works. The two materials react with each other, and because zinc is more reactive than the iron in the steel, the zinc corrodes instead of the steel, thus protecting the structure of the tray. So if steel containment is so very rugged, why don't we just use that everywhere? Well, cost is one thing, as it could be seen as overkill in many places where it simply isn't required. Another is that even with the galvanised protection in any of the forms just discussed, it will still corrode over time if used in the wrong environment. Additionally, if the metalwork is cut or drilled, then the exposed metalwork will need to be treated with a suitable galvanising spray to protect it thoroughly. There's one other drawback to galvanised steel containment as well. We find this further on in the same section of Guidance Note 1 that we looked at earlier. Bare copper sheathed cables should not be laid in contact with zinc plated or galvanised materials such as cable tray in damp conditions. This is because the electropotential series indicates that zinc is anodic to copper and therefore preferential corrosion of the zinc plating may occur. This action will not affect the copper but may cause corrosion of the cable tray. The presence of moisture is essential to produce electrolytic action, so in dry conditions this action will not occur. If moisture is present, electrolytic action will take place, but the extent of any corrosion is dependent upon the relative areas of the two metals and the conductivity of the electrolyte, moisture in this instance. In these circumstances, thermoplastic sheathing should be used. 
So this paragraph is pointing out that if you lay a copper sheathed cable like this mineral insulated cable onto a cable tray, you're actually creating a potential problem. This problem is all about how dissimilar metals behave when they come into contact with each other and it boils down to where the metals sit in what was referred to there as the electropotential series. You may know it from school and as we mentioned earlier as the galvanic series. It's basically a list of materials placed in order depending on how reactive or unreactive they are to each other with the least reactive usually at the top and the most reactive at the bottom. If two of these materials come into contact with each other with some form of moisture between them, they will start to react with each other chemically. Because copper sits above zinc in the list, it means that zinc is anodic to copper, to use the technical term, and the presence of the copper will make the zinc corrode, possibly leading to failure of the containment. This can be gotten around by various means, but it does show that we need to take care when selecting our materials. There's similar guidance in the same section of Guidance Note 1 on not allowing contact between bare aluminium and brass or other high copper content materials. So if we were to opt for aluminium containment, we'd still need to take precautions against this electrolytic action. We'd also need to avoid using stainless steel fixings to join galvanised fittings to each other for this exact same reason. Of course, so far we've discussed general conditions indoors and outdoors, but let's think about harsher situations. Guidance Note 1 continues. Hostile environments and chemicals also can attack the conductor, its insulation and sheath, and any enclosure or equipment. Examples of this mutual detrimental influence are A. Petroleum products, creosote, some solvents, hydrocarbons and oil-based paints may attack rubber and polymeric materials such as thermoplastic. B. Plasticizers migrating to polystyrene from thermoplastic and also to some types of plaster. C. Hostile atmospheres, for example those in the vicinity of plastics processing machinery and vulcanising, which produces a sulphurous atmosphere. D. Coastal areas with salt-laden air. And E. Locations where animals are kept, agricultural environments, kennels, etc., as animal urine can be corrosive. So there's a few locations there that could present problems to our containment. For example, indent D refers to coastal areas with salt-laden air. This will eventually even cause problems for the super tough hot dipped galvanised tray, leading to corrosion and eventual failure. So what's the solution in this situation? Well, it may be time then to turn to a plastic option. A relatively new innovation is PVCU cable tray that can withstand this type of external influence and is available with all the accessories of metal tray for the same flexibility in installation. PVCU has excellent resistance to UV, which is why it's the standard material for doors and windows in homes all across the country. Interestingly, the bulk of this plastic tray from Marshall Tuflex is actually made up from old windows and doors that get recycled and reprocessed into this innovative product. If you plan to use PVCU products outside, Marshall Tuflex strongly recommend you contact their technical helpline to confirm its suitability. If, however, the location is going to expose the containment to extremely high levels of ultraviolet light or extreme temperatures, then you may want to switch up to glass reinforced polyester instead. This material will hold up much better in those circumstances, plus it's lightweight and self-extinguishing and also has no halogen, making it suitable in installations that require low smoke and fume products in the event of a fire. So that's great if you decide to use it indoors as well. The list of things that could have a detrimental influence on our containment from Guidance Note 1 also makes mention of petroleum products, solvents and other hostile environments featuring airborne chemicals. These might occur in chemical processing plants and similar, so what type of containment would we use in those areas? Well, it very much depends on what exactly is in the atmosphere. The way to tell if the material that you want to use will be okay in those environments is to consult data sheets from the manufacturer. For PVCU products, Marshall Tuflex have this data sheet that contains a vast range of chemicals and an indication of whether it's okay to use PVCU products in areas where they're likely to come into contact with each other. So, for example, acetic acid, which is used as a food preservative, but also in huge quantities in certain inks, dyes, photographic chemicals, pesticides, pharmaceuticals, and other things. If we look that up on the chart, we find that if this comes into contact with PVCU in the form of a 60% aqueous or water-based solution, that we get a tick in the 20 degrees C and the 60 degrees C temperature columns, meaning the containment would perform satisfactorily in these circumstances. However, looking at something like carbon tetrachloride, which is used as a cleansing agent in the dry cleaning industry, at 20 degrees C it's rated with a hash mark, which according to the key means some attack or absorption. The material may be considered for use when alternative materials are unsatisfactory 
and where limited life is acceptable. When PVC is to be used with such chemicals, full-scale trials under realistic conditions are necessary. So that should trigger you to think about an alternative material, or at least to consider if the substance is likely to come into contact with the containment, which would mean looking at the processes involved with that chemical and how it's used in the area of installation. At 60 degrees, the chemical is marked with this sign, which actually means approximately equal, but in this case takes us to this rating. Unsatisfactory. So rated because of decomposition, solution, swelling, loss of ductility, etc. of the samples tested. So clearly, that would not be an acceptable application of PVCU containment if it's likely to come into contact with that chemical at that temperature. Interestingly, it sounds like the lab techs at Marshall Tuflex had a great day on the day they determined that cider and beer wouldn't negatively affect PVCU containment. I wonder what happened to the samples after those tests. No data at 60 degrees either, which makes sense because when's beer likely to get that hot? As an Englishman, there's nothing I like more than a warm pint, but that's taken it a bit far even for me. So there we go, that's how you select the correct materials for your containment. But you may be wondering, how can you make sure the containment doesn't exceed its weight limits and won't fall off the ceiling? Well, to find out more about that, check out this video right here, or click the link in the description below to watch it as part of our free training package to help you with your CPD, and you'll receive a certificate as well. All that remains in this video is to say, thank you very much for watching.